This is the kind of evening where it's mostly about honoring Charles, but we've kind of come to the honor, end of the honoring section, frankly, okay? And we're gonna start talking more about his views and also a, have a, a broader uh, sense of what's going on in the Middle East with the help of Ehud Barak. You know, if you haven't read Charles's autobiography called Distilled, and you're in it, you're probably in bad shape because he's not very kind to himself or to anyone else. It's, it's actually an extremely honest, exceptionally honest book. And Books that's are on sale in the back. <laughs> <laughs> but it's one of the things that's quite special about Charles is that he's not afraid to look deep inside himself or inside of anything. So he's not, he's not interested in Pablo. He's interested in getting to what we care about. And I, I think maybe we'll start, before we get straight to the Middle East, I just want to ask you, Charles, to talk a little bit about what specifically drove you uh, in your philanthropy toward Israel. I think that one of the, one of the most interesting things has to do with your, uh, the way you and Michael Steinhardt formed uh, Birthright. And there was, you know, is this sort of a coming together of two not terribly similar people, as you said in your book. Tell us a little bit about that, and then we'll get on to Israel and the Middle East. Well, one of the great relationships I've had since I moved here in 1996 was meeting Judy and Michael Steinhardt. Uh, now, some of you who know Michael well will be amazed to know that Michael and I have never had a fight. Never. We've never, we've never had uh, hard words against each other. We have had a real male love affair. And it started really before we met again in Jerusalem when Judy was the chair of the American Friends of the Israel Museum. They were having a, a big dinner and Michael asked if he could see me outside. So we went outside and we sat down on a, a wall and Michael talked about a proposal that a man who Ehud knows very well, Yossi Balin, had made which said that all 17 year old Jews throughout the world should get a voucher for a trip to Israel. And I asked Yossi, I remember, well, where are you gonna get the money? He said, well, from the Jewish agency, because they put it down the drains anyway. And I said, well, that may or may not be true, but politically it ain't gonna happen. So Michael was taken with his idea, and something went in his head about it. And uh, he said, well, how about that? And I said, well, it's a scheme, obviously, to uh, bankrupt the Jewish people, so we can't do that. So I said, but at the same time, it's audacious. He, he liked that word, audacious. And that was the beginning of our negotiation. And he and I and our colleagues, uh, Yitz Greenberg and Jeff Solomon, worked for the next year. And lo and behold, birthright happened. Uh, and it and happened when you were prime minister, by the way. Do you remember right. that? Uh, yeah. I remember. Yeah, I, I, until I came, no one was ready to approve the other part of it, namely that the Israeli government will give uh, exactly. another 20 million. He came to you and asked for some money, yeah. didn't he? Yeah, I approved it immediately. <laughs> I remember walking into your office. I remember walking into your office and asking yeah. you. Yeah. With uh, uh, Michael Steinhardt and Len Abramson. Yeah, and there was one. No, it was uh, just me at that time. Oh. I, I had the chutzpah to ask you. And, and you didn't take long to say yes. But no, I, uh, I, maybe 15 in fact, seconds. I, I listened to Yossi Balin. He told me, that's good, approve it. So I didn't have time, <laughs> so I approved. <laughs> But the, the thing that, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, Charles, and then I want Ehud you to chime in on this too. One of the points you make when you talk in your book about setting up Birthright Israel is that you and Michael had slightly different concerns. Michael was worried about assimilation, and you were worried about what you spoke about at the podium a minute ago, which is the increasing need to uni for unity among Jews who are uh, between the diaspora and the Israeli Jews. So. Let's talk about that issue now in a, in a less celebratory and more analytical way. What are you worried about today? I'm worried about the, the divide between <coughs> Israel and the diaspora. I think it, it is so sad to see things like the agreement about the Kotel and the conversion agreement, I, to see those go down the tubes. Uh, if, if one says that one is prime minister not only of his Israel, but of the Jewish people. One cannot then denigrate half of the Jewish people because maybe they don't have the same way of celebrating Judaism as others do. And 
So Ehud, weigh in here a little bit. I mean, I'm sure you don't really disagree with him, but on the other hand, having sat in the seat that the Prime Minister of Israel sits in now, you know that that's not so simple with regard to his political coalition questions. Do you think it is being mishandled in Israel? Yeah, for sure. The fact that nothing is simple when you're sitting in a chair of the Prime Minister of Israel, but that doesn't mean that it should paralyze you. You are there <laughs> in order to make decisions. And they should uh, be characterized more than anything else by a focus about where we are heading and about integrity and common sense. And I think that the way that this issue was treated uh, contradicts all three. Because basically there was an agreement processed along years by not other than the general attorney who is uh, himself, is a Yarmulka, is a his religious person. And it was done in agreement with the um, religious parties in the Knesset. So it was, it was a done deal that in a whim of a moment was canceled because of some temporary momentary uh, pressure. That's not the way to uh, run uh, Israel or the Zionist project. And we suffer from it on other issues as well. Well, okay, let's let, l tell me why what you're suffering from, even e despite the fact that Charles and some people in this room aren't happy with it. How is Israel suffering from what it's from this position it's taken on this issue? No, I think that for all along the, the, the way Zionism was clever enough, movement, the most successful national movement in the 20th century, and it was successful because it. Well, clever enough that our leaders, for founding fathers, were clever enough to combine a concrete action in the, on the ground with always being sensitive about holding the moral high ground, both internally among ourselves and vis-a-vis -vis the world. Now, we cannot hold the moral high ground without behaving a certain way. It has to do with major policy, policies in regard to the, the even two-state solution. It has to do, of course, about the relationship with the American Jewry. It's all important issue for Israel. Israel is very closely dependent upon a bipartisan, a wide and deep support uh, in America, and that was extremely kind of uh, got a tailwind from the Jewish community. And, you know, even if they were not so important politically and other ways, or by, by supporting us at any moment of truth, just for being a Jew, I, I cannot understand how the hell we feel the authority to define for Jews how to be Jews. Judaism was always about debates, always about uh, creativity, always about changing ways to adapt to life. It was never kind of frozen. And no one can tell you uh, that the orthodox version of Judaism is worse any more, uh, any kind of a, a gram more than the Judaism of anyone here or, or out there all over the United States. And, and <laughs> And, and Charles, I mean, it's partly your job to worry, of course, but do you really think that there is a greater gap between American Jews and Israeli Jews today than there was, say, 25 years ago? Yes, I do. Uh, and 25 years ago was a very different world. I think things started changing when Israel was perceived no longer to be David, but Goliath. And that started to make things difficult. It's hard to blame Israel for that. I'm not blaming Israel. I'm just talking about what, what is and what was. What was when those of us who are not only my age, but say 10 or 15 years and 20 years younger, was that the, the miracle of Israel that I mentioned on the podium, the miracle of Israel was in our hearts and in our souls. And the terrible battles, the 48 battle, the 56, the 67, the 73, all those terrible battles when Israel itself was totally threatened to A, never exist, and B, to be wiped out. Uh, those things influence us so very much. Then when the incursion into Lebanon happened in 1980, 
uh, things started to change. And uh, as my dear friend Martin Indyk uh, said one time, he said, you know, when we were talking about Hasbara, he said, you can have all the Hasbara in the world, but if you have a picture on television or in a newspaper of an Israeli tank and a 10-year-old Palestinian boy standing in front of it, game's over. Using the weapon of David, the original weapon. It's, uh, but do you, do you, Ehud, you spend a lot of time in this country now. Do you feel that Charles' concern is legitimate that there is a greater divide today than in the past? There is a great divide and great deterioration in the relationship. I, I was a graduate student at Stanford some 35 years ago. In any leading university, there was a cell of Israelis, former Israelis, Jews, and certain Gentiles who fought aggressively for the cause of Israel. Now I travel on the kind of speaking uh, circle in American universities. In every university, there is a cell of Israelis, former Israel Jews, and uh, some Palestinians or Arabs who are fighting for the cause of the Palestinians. And that's a dramatic change. We are losing. We are losing the next uh, generation here. And there is a simple way, not through propaganda, there is a simple way to correct it by adapting the right policies, which uh, Charles mentioned of two-state solution, and with uh, making sure, once again, that we hold to the moral high ground, that we will always let the other side to reject. We just celebrated the 70 years of, of 29th of November, 47. The real difference was that Ben-Gurion, at a very tough decision, accepted the partition plan. The Palestinians rejected it. In those terms, of, of today terms, with the post-truth uh, post and, and alternative facts, I know what the right wing would have said about Ben-Gurion. This weak person, because he uh, uh, capitulated and accepted this humiliating plan, the Arabs saw that he is uh, weak, and they followed on and opened the war. And we know that the opposite is true. It is only his farsightedness that realized that if this other side will open, oh, we'll still hold them more like on. This instinct to be white, not that just strong, is something that our government lost at a very heavy price on the world arena and in this country. Okay, so, so then let's talk about how we get there. Because, so now we're, let's focus a little bit on the Palestinian-Israeli negotiation question, this new not-so-new administration in this country that says it's working towards something. Do you think, Ehud, I know you've been very critical of the prime minister. I know you prefer to do that more in Israel than when you're abroad, but you've been very critical, certainly on this issue about him. Let me ask you, do you think that given his legal problems, that if he's presented with a plan forward in the coming, say, five months by the Trump administration, that he will run with it in order to promote elections on that ground? Or do you think he's not capable of that? I, I don't think that I have to, to comment on this, N not here in this church and not even in Israel. Uh, it's uh, time will tell, and we won't have to wait a lot. First of all, we have to see what kind of uh, plan will be put on the table. We do. Will it be just a kind of a camouflage plan or something very real that demand concrete decisions from both sides. And it, if, we, if that's the case, it will look like exactly what uh, Charles talked about, what Susie talked about, was uh, what Amnon Reshef, uh, with commanders for Israel security, trying to argue with the people. They don't pretend that they can bring immediate peace, but they say loud and clear what should be done by Israel in the meantime. 85% of Israelis, you know, in fact, 70% of Israelis, Israelis support two-state solution. 80% support separation for the Palestinians. Ask yourself, what's the difference? When you talk about two-state solution, you look as equals on the Palestinians. That's not good for Israelis. So uh, if you say separation, that sounds more kind of, uh, we decide, we separate. And so I recently uh, invented the new term, divorce, from the Palestinians. That's got 85%. Uh, everyone wants to divorce. 
<laughs> but who blocked the divorce? The, the body that blocks the divorce is the government of Israel. Uh, we all agree, we all agree about the settlement blocks with uh, the Jewish neighborhoods in Jerusalem beyond the uh, 67 border, presence along the jo River Jordan. We all agree of it, and that includes 80% of the settlers on very small amount of, of uh, ground. And we all agree that Israel full control of uh, responsibility for security should remain in our hands for as long as needed. So the whole difference is now about the isolated settlements, some 100 of them with 100,000 people that you cannot explain. It's a not an asset for our security, it's a liability. It's a burden on our security. And that's what blocks us from being able uh, to divorce. And I think that by realizing it, you understand what happens. We got a government freely elected, it's my government as well, but this government has a clear uh, agenda. One state solution, not two state solutions, one state solution. Because they fully understand that in order to implement one state solution, you will have to go very far with practices that will contradict the Israeli law, contradict international law, and will cause us lose the support of many of you. So they now in a fully fledged assault on the Israeli democracy. They are in a fully fledged attack on the Supreme Court, on uh, civil society, on the free media, and even on the ethical code of the IDF. That's the issue and the time had come to stop talking to kind of generously about it. We, we, it's not, we, we feel uneasy to talk about it, but the time had come to tackle. Otherwise, it will remain hollow rhetoric. It will be on the record that you were against where we are heading, but we won't be able to stop it. Okay, so you're not afraid to talk about this outside of Israel. <laughs> It was a modest version. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Charles, I don't think you disagree with anything that uh, Ibn Barak has said. Do you have any sense of the... I, well, I want to get to possibility of your entering politics again in a minute with your permission, but before you ask we... Charles. No, not Charles, that. you. <laughs> before we do that, though, we do have a new Labour Party leader. It's not called the Labour Party anymore, but okay. Have you been paying attention to the way he has sort of triangulated and in order to apparently appeal to the right and irritate the left, but we don't know where he's going? Do you have any sense about Avi Gabay, Charles, you'd well, like to share? Well, that? actually, I happen to be fortunate enough to be at UJA Federation only today when uh, I first met Avi Gabay, and he spoke, uh, I must say what he was saying, uh, uh, hit a very good chord. Uh, he seems bright, very bright, uh, wide awake. He knows where he wants to go. Now, whether his political party will go with him, that's another question I'm not capable to answer. He's obviously taking that party and moving it towards the center. Uh, whether that's good, bad, or indifferent, I don't know except he seems like a very strong person, a very committed person, and his uh, wanting to be prime minister is very obvious. So uh, all I can say is good luck to him, good luck to anybody who can actually take the forces of good, which are from the right center right to the center left, and uh, if they can form a coalition uh, to be a new government, to get some fresh faces uh, and, and do things that uh, the world would applaud and Israelis would applaud, and that would be a wonderful thing. Edward, what's your sense about this? Do you think moving to the center that way is the wise move? Uh, I think that he's a very good person. I said it from day one. At the beginning of his running for leadership of labor, it was only his mother, which is about my age and myself, who believed that he will win. And even in the second round, the whole probably except for uh, staff, uh, the whole party leadership uh, surrounded Amir Peretz and said, Eud, are you crazy? This man cannot win. First of all, I cannot be crazy. I'm not even a member of the party. But I tell you that he's going to win, and everyone should see it. I don't understand how you can see it. And I think that he's very, very, he's a solid person. 
he is not a great orator, but uh, after listening to so many great orators for, for so long time without anything happens, the, I think that there is a healthy uh, uh, thirst or, or hunger in the public to listen to someone talks on eye level, meaning what he says, not just uh, playing like someone who plays in, in front of the prompter as a TV anchor or, or a, kind of a, someone on, uh, on uh, podiums. And he's doing uh, hard work. I hear, heard from many people who met with him in such situation where he look you at the eye, you can ask whatever you want, and he leaves very good impression. And I wish him and uh, staff at the party, political party level, and Amnon Reshef on the part, on the level of uh, uh, political activity with no party identif uh, identification. And there are two young people here, probably you raise your hand, Shai Cohen and uh, Itai Sasson, who, yeah, over there at the center, who are working at a grassroots level with Crossroads and, and the, um, the Alliance for the Future of Israel. They are working on, the cro on grassroots level to wake up the people, to wake up the center and left and tell them the democracy is in our hands. It's about voting. Don't, yeah, don't, don't cry, don't complain, don't, don't look backward, frustrated. Come, act now and vote. So w what I don't understand though is it, a few minutes ago you said that it's the problem is just the 100,000 settlers or so who are beyond the main blocks, and that's what's standing between us and getting somewhere. But he has specifically said he sees no need to move settlers. So I don't understand how you square the circle. No, no, it's not. It's not you have to listen in Hebrew in a very accurate manner. He, he does the right thing. You cannot win. The, the labor brand alone probably cannot hold the burden of changing the direction of politics. You need much wider coalition. It's, it, it's not a damage to our camp if merit will get a little bit stronger. And you cannot win but by taking some of the voters that naturally will vote for the white. So you have to talk in a language. And if you look honestly, it doesn't, it, it, it's not different from the language that Rabin used when he won and the language that I used when I won. You have to talk in a way that soft, so to speak, right-wingers, people who are patriots as all of us and want a, a, a good country that they will be able to identify with you. So he, first of all, he talks to the uh, religious in a way that I can hardly talk to them, but he's a... Brought up right, he, he argued that the left has lost its sense of Jewishness in order to... Uh, yeah, he, he made one mistake of quoting Bibi and, and uh, praised his... So it was a mistake to quote the, 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 the words of Bibi. But basically when he said, he said something which makes sense. We are, it's not practical now. We don't have a, a, someone to sit on the other side of the table and discuss the future of the settlement. So he said, we cannot exclude the possibility that some creative solution might be found and we should not be as zealot as to announce right now that none of these settlements can stand. In fact, Yossi Bailey, our leftist friend of many of us, used to say, if they want to stay there, right. let them come after five years, give everyone who wants to stay, to stay there, we will protect them. After five years, we'll ask who really wants to stay there and none will uh, be ready to stay. So we have to think of it creatively. Politics is not that kind of binary kind of operation. Okay, that's fine. Let's, let's broaden. <laughs> In other words, you say one thing and hopefully do something later or different. Okay, that's fine. Let's. Let's broaden the lens a little bit out from Israel Palestine. There, there is different practices that brings you to power and different practices in modern politics to reign. Nicely so you, you will never be there if you are not ready to be a little bit flexible about the practice. First of all, go there. And then we will expect you to do what has to be done. Okay. Let's, let's broaden the lens a little bit out to the region, which has been in extraordinary turmoil in the last six or seven years, right? 
uh, and and it has in it's been inside of Israel. There's been a big debate about whether the Arab uprisings were an opportunity or uh, a scary moment for Israel. Whether this is the moment to step forward with a two-state solution or the moment to hunker down. You can imagine where the left-right divide is on that. But right now, what's happened as a result of the Iran-Saudi um, competition, which has grown so fierce and so specific in a way that wasn't true a decade or two ago, is that it seems that the Israeli government believes that if it, it can sort of hold on to be part of one side in that battle, and therefore it can, there can be pressure put on the Palestinians to accept things they wouldn't otherwise accept. What's your sense about that, Ehud? I think we are missing an opportunity for three or three years now. For three years, we have a clear common interest with the um, moderate Sunnite leaderships, the Emirates, the Gulf states, the Saudi uh, Arabia, Egypt, uh, Jordan. And we should join hands with them uh, based on common interest to, to corner the uh, Iranian hegemonic and nuclear intention to uh, block the support of terror and to join hands in huge uh, project, re regional projects. And we are missing it for no reason. We know from Bougie Herzog, some of you heard him describing the meetings that had been with, with the leadership basically of the whole area. And somehow the, our government prefers to talk about it, but not to execute it. So there is a theory that they can do something. I, I, I don't believe it. it won't fly if we are not ready to discuss seriously the issues, the core issues with the Palestinians. Not because they have a great love to the Palestinians, but because their streets have. And they, can, they, cannot, they cannot sit stable in their uh, seats as long as Israel uh, uh, you know, kind of corner the Palestinians doesn't negotiate. So you see them. no change in that. That remains steady. I don't see it. Probably under other pressure, something will change, but I'm not sure. May I ask please, uh, please. Uh, Ehud a question? Ehud, uh, it's been said, or common wisdom says, that there cannot be a deal, a regional deal, unless Israel and the Palestinians not necessarily come to peace, but at least show that they're on the road uh, to peace. Does that still hold, even with the MBS, as he's now called, Mohammed ben, ben Salman, uh, is, does that still hold, is, or is MBS going to change the, the ground rules, or what do you see there? I don't, I don't believe. What, what happened in Saudi Arabia is dramatic. It's a revolution. It took a generation to the Emirates to go incrementally into this slightly more open uh, situation. He tries to do it overnight, and it's still under question mark whether it will work. He tries to signal to the Shiite banana led by Iran that now he takes uh, the forward position, but he's a, he's a very very young person. He's 32 probably with the life experience of a 32 uh, capable individual. Uh, that might not suffice. I think that the basic element that the public's in the Sunnite um, countries cannot see their leadership going, accepting Israel formally as the members of the family of nation in the region without showing that Israel made certain steps toward the Palestinians. So I don't believe probably something symbolic he can allow an al fly over the kingdom and shorten the way to Thailand by two hours, but that's that not to open some, some uh, business office in some uh, corner of Riyadh. But that's, uh, probably Netanyahu will present it as a major breakthrough, but that it, it won't fly. It won't fly before we understand that it has to do not with propaganda, but with substance. Politics have a layer of uh, firework and camouflage and whatever and cellophane, but it had has also an element or layer of substance. If you are not there, you will end up just talking. Nothing will be is, really is, achieved. Isn't the truth of the matter that, that neither Netanyahu nor Abbas want anything but the status quo, 
So they're quite happy with P that? Probably. They, they were so deeply frustrated by each other. And I still think that uh, Abu Mazen carries more responsibility for where we are standing now than uh, Netanyahu or any other uh, Israeli prime minister. But it's still, the, the truth is that whenever someone put any proposal on the table, what they have in mind is the blame game. It's not the substance. They not, do not really look at what's there. They start to calculate from, from the first step how the blame game will end. And that's a very bad kind of recipe for a successful uh, reconciliation. I, I want to ask you something else. When I've talked to Israeli security officials in the last couple of years, many, not all, have said that it's inevitable that there will be another conflict with Hezbollah. Not, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. Do you agree with that? I don't know of anything which is inevitable, but for sure the uh, IDF and Israel should prepare itself because it's, uh, if it's not inevitable, it's a significant probability it will happen. And you cannot be, if, if you think that it's 60%, you cannot be 60% prepared. You have to be 100% prepared. So for them, better to prepare as if it's going to happen and the uh, better we will be prepared, the softer will be the shock when a real uh, clash uh, erupts. And we have to win. You, you know, you cannot, you cannot choose your, your... A person cannot choose his parents, and a nation cannot choose its neighbors, they are, whoever they are. The Middle East is like a common residence. I don't know how you call it, co-op or condominium, probably. Something that uh, with many bad neighbors. And uh, one of them, which is short of perfect, is the Palestinians. So we are doomed or, or destined to live with these neighbors in this uh, big house. But why the hell to live in the same apartment with all the Palestinians? Why not to have 80% of the apartment with 80% Jews rather than 100% of the apartment with 50% of Jews? That's crazy. You won't take such decision in any other arena. And it's only this kind of post-truth. You know, Bibi made a form of art, of uh, uh, fake news and alternative facts and whataboutism. Uh, long before those terms got any traction in the English language. And uh, so we suffer from it because the, the opposition until uh, Gabay was a little bit too soft. And uh, Bougie, I should admit, did it for... Uh, great cause. He saw that something uh, serious is cooking underneath the surface, and uh, it ended up that nothing was there. So I hope that now we are open-eyed, public understand that it only will be decided when government will be changed and a better track will be taken. So, so speaking of changing the government, um, I, I, I've been observing you for many years. I first started covering you when you were chief of staff in the early 90s. Of course, you were in the army, and then you were in politics, so you were not in a position to speak as freely as you have in the last year or two. I feel like you've been kind of liberated to really speak your heart, and you have drawn attention to your views in a way that was harder. Are you thinking again about entering, trying to become prime minister? You did say a month ago you were the most qualified person in Israel to be that job. No, I say that objectively I'm the most qualified. <laughs> It doesn't mean I, did, that <laughs> I didn't say you didn't say it objectively. You said it. I added. I, I, th added I think you and Neely will agree to that. I added that in direct election, I would defeat uh, Bibi in the secular kind of population. But I said there is no direct election. Too many people in the left still feel the scars from my uh, term in the left, not in the right. And they, if they have a choice, they would not vote for me. I say that I'm not a perfect uh, political manipulator, and my gift to uh, careless egos uh, is uh, less than mediocre, and those, uh, those are needed skills in politics. So, <laughs> in a way, objectively, I'm probably uh, better prepared to do it than anyone else, including Bibi, who has a lot of experience but no capacity to take decisions. But in practice, one of the reasons that I'm so rel uh, relieved and feel free is the fact that I don't intend to join politics. So at least tell the people the truth and uh, help them to wake up and see what has to be done. I see. So <laughs>
it's like it's like a courtship where you've each convinced the other that there's no hope, and so everything, all the barriers are gone. And you never know where that's going to go, Mr. Barat. What do you think, Charles? Do you think Ehud should run for a prime minister again? That is up to Neely, not up to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably true, actually. Um, so we only have a few probably minutes. Probably Rita will convince Charles to run, and Neely will convince me to lead the IPF. <laughs> <laughs> We've only a few minutes before they want us to stop. So I wanted to, you, you did say earlier, Ehud, that you were very worried about elements of democracy in Israel, the attack on the court and on the press. I want to talk a little bit about that with both of you because it, you know, it's an issue as a reporter when I was there, constantly the left would call me, human rights groups would call me and say, this place is turning into a fascist dictatorship and so forth. And it was always my job to sort of sift through it and figure out where we are exactly. How serious a risk is there? I think that it goes from, from you know, from uh, bad to worse, it's uh, we are on a kind of spiral, spiraling downward. Uh, if someone would have told me two years ago that the Knesset could sit down and pass a, what's called in uh, legal terms lex specialis to personally to save the prime minister from from something almost technical that the police will announce its finding and whether it found a basis for indictment. It's uh, the way it is done is crazy. When uh, someone like Benny Begin, who is right wing, extreme right wing, but a liberal and honest person with integrity, he asked that a paragraph will, be, will enter into the law that will say explicitly that this law uh, relates only to future cases. It doesn't uh, go uh, retrospectively. And he was uh, ejected out of the committee in order to enable that. That would not have passed the common sense of Israelis several years ago. There was a law uh, that they tried to pass probably half a year ago, which allowed the government to confiscate private property of living Palestinians in an area, the West Bank, uh, Judea Samaria, where Israel had not even uh, demanded sovereignty. So Bibi, when he saw it first at the cabinet table, he said, oh, that's crazy law. It will bring us government, uh, into the Hague. And Bennett and um, Ayelet Shaked agreed but Bibi is Bibi, so he doesn't uh, follow. And thus, this law is removed from the table. It will not be brought to the minister's committee and will not put on the table of the Knesset, period. He waited to contemplate his observation and to see the, uh, the response. Within five hours, he had a, a document sign, signed by 26 out of 30 of his members of Knesset, which means that everyone except him, Steinitz, Benny Begin, and, and one more, and all demanded to pass the law. And he capitulated, this Bibi, so he capitulated, and then he brought it, and then Shaked and Bennett could not left behind, so they followed. So basically that's a bizarre situation where a government cannot take responsibility for what is right, what is wrong, what should be done, what isn't done, and just rely on the Supreme Court that they will re reject it as unconstitutional. But at the same time, they try to castrate the Supreme Court. That's, we are in a bizarre situation. It would not pass the judgment of the Israeli public a few years ago, but that's the result of gr incremental brainwashing of the public and killing softly the healthy instincts of a democratic system. Okay, uh, Charles, um, we're going to end. Unfortunate, no. <laughs> no, no, I think it's very important uh, to hear what you've got to say on this. So thank you very much for sharing. Charles, you uh, are known for your realism, but also for your optimism. So maybe you can blend some of the concerns that Ehud has produced uh, with some of your lifelong optimism and end us on some kind of appropriate note. Well, in the first place, I, 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 I agree with Ehud that... Uh, and it's not up to me, to, by the way, to agree I am not a citizen of Israel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But 
from what I read, <coughs> the, uh, the Demo some of the major democratic principles of the Jewish people and of the state of Israel and of democracies are being sacrificed uh, right now in order to keep a coalition alive. And uh, you know, you can say what you want about Bibi, but he is a master at coalition politics. And he cares very much that he wakes up tomorrow as Prime Minister of Israel. That is of great, great concern to him. And he plays his cards very cleverly. And if we take these two laws that we mentioned earlier about the Kotel and about the conversions, he really didn't give a damn about the diaspora, but it got him his coalition votes in the Knesset. And that's what he really cared about. And if you're gonna play that game, it's fine for a while, but then eventually you're putting the country at risk, you're putting democratic principles at risk, and you're putting your, um, your uh, acceptability by other democratic countries at risk. And God knows Israel has enough problems already without having to uh, question, have anybody question its democratic principles. Did you want so, to say one more thing? So that, so that said, uh, I think that I have faith in the Israeli public, in the, particularly in the Jews of Israel, that they will say, no, this is enough. I should add to it, I, um, I'm still optimist. It doesn't blind me from seeing where we are heading, but uh, I'm a great believer in the um, kind of a fighting will of the Israeli public once it will realize. Probably it's always too late, and it seems to be too late, but they will, when the public will realize where we are heading, and I'm trying to wake his attention uh, through the Twitter or whatever, I'm Trumping, I call it. Uh, to, when I suffer a jet lag, I wake up at uh, 3 o'clock in the morning, I start to tweet. And uh, in a very blunt manner, that's the mood in 3 o'clock uh, a.m. So uh, basically, I think that uh, the public in Israel will change the direction. Uh, Likud was in power for 40 years. They did some good things. And now it's time to tell them, thank you. Uh, we need new leadership fresh leadership, different direction, which are congruent with uh, realities and with the real uh, needs of uh, Israel and the Jewish people. I see. Okay, uh, thank you guys very much. I see David Halford in the wings. Yeah, right. Uh, and He's before, skulking in the background there, so we got to uh, go. Uh, and before we, but before we end this part of the evening, I personally would like to thank uh, you, Mr. Prime Minister, and you, Mr. Inquisitor, <laughs> for, for being with us. Uh, I also would like to thank very, very much everybody who had anything to do with this beautiful evening. My w wonderful wife, Rita, who made this room look so lovely. <laughs> the, the staff at uh, IPF, uh, my own colleagues. Uh, I'd like to thank my family very, very much. Many members of my family are here with us tonight. And as to Mr. Tony Cohen, the, the great uh, counter of honors uh, on the screen, and everybody who participated in that beautiful, beautiful video, I'm really very, very grateful. And I Charles, thank you we all. are all honored to be here on the stage with you, and say you are a great Jew, great leader, and a great mensch. And we thank all you. love you. Thank you.